everyone, it's Jack from CarDarling.com, and you know what time of the week it is. Well, it's not technically Friday, but, you know, Friday was Christmas Day, so I didn't do one then. Understandably, I, I think you'd agree. But don't worry, because I'm now going to travel slightly back in time and relive my favourite time of the week. And you know why it's my favourite time of the week, because it was Friday, Friday. Gotta get down on Friday, because it's time to talk about my final wrestlers of the week who is going to be wrestler of the year for 2020 but on a much more serious note there's only one honorable mention this week and of course it goes without saying it is john huber aka Brody lee aka luke harper the news of john's very tragic passing has been very shocking uh, especially at such a young age uh, and I think it's it's great to just reflect on what an amazing wrestler he was, first of all, but also, and um, probably more importantly, what an amazing human he seemed to have been because of all the stories that have come out about amazing times that various different wrestlers from various different promotions have spent with him have really proven what an incredible guy he was. Uh, so obviously our condolences go out to all of his friends and family. And it's, yeah, it's, it's just a really sad one, isn't it? But I couldn't give an honorable mention to anybody else this week. And now on to the top 10 and number 10 this week, we're going back to TLC, which feels like quite a while ago now because this video is going out slightly later. But number 10 this week is Kevin Owens. Owens came up short, of course, at TLC, which perhaps explains why he only gets one point this week. But he came up short against someone he was realistically never going to be for the championship in the form of Roman Reigns. But despite that, I still feel as though Owens was a good matchup. For Roman, because as was really alluded to in the build, Owens is the sort of guy that's just not going to give up no matter how much you throw at him. And that was really proven not just in the build-up, but in the match itself as well. Owens just wouldn't, you know, say die in this TLC match. He kept going. He was put through tables. He kept crawling back for more. Roman put a serious beating on Kevin Owens. And that made those little moments where Owens looked like he might be about to snatch a victory all the more thrilling, even if perhaps... We never seriously thought it was going to happen. But still, a great performance from Kev. Uh, I would have loved to have seen him get his hands on that Universal Championship once again. But I do recognize that at the moment, Roman is the hottest thing, possibly in all of WWE right now, and has to keep that title upon himself to carry a compelling story forward into WrestleMania season. So I get that, but a great performance from Kev nonetheless. Number nine, we're sticking with TLC for just a second, and we're going to talk about the Scottish psycho... What is, what's his nickname now? We're talking about Drew McIntyre, the WWE champion still. Now, Drew's match was probably the other really enjoyable match of the night on TLC, to be honest. Those two signature match types really carried the show uh, to quite a, quite a well-received level in the end, I think. It was quite good across the board, but those two TLC matches were real standouts. And Drew's was a little bit more sports entertaining, perhaps, than Owen's and Reigns's, because, of course, we had The Miz cashing in uh, midway through to turn it into a triple threat match. We had AJ Styles performing really well, too. Uh, but ultimately, it was, of course, Drew McIntyre, who stood tall at the end on one leg, effectively, as the WWE Champion still. And again, like in the Kevin Owens-Roman Reigns match, I feel like Drew might only be getting two points simply because it seemed very unlikely that he was going to lose the title at this stage. It seems like the two top champions in the men's divisions of WWE are pretty set until... WrestleMania, I mean, we could see maybe one of them lose it and then win a Rumble or something, but I think it looks like they're pretty set in stone for now. Anyway, Drew's performance continues to show why he is such a great champion. He's one of those baby faces in WWE that manages to just be innately likable and they don't need to change too much about him, both in his promos and his delivery and everything, but in the way he wrestles as well. He's a no-nonsense ass kicker. Even when he's towering above his opponent or opponents uh, at stages of this match, it's still easy to get behind him, not only because he's outnumbered, but because the other two were just so detestable and he's so heroic and strong and mighty. It's like almost a throwback to the 80s where the baby faces were all big and strong and they were against, you know, less conventionally heroic looking opponents. And despite that, it still works. Uh, and it still works because of the way his matches are structured. Often Drew is going up against some kind of odds that he has to overcome. It's classic wrestling booking, but when you're as good as Drew, you can make that work 100%. As mentioned, I do think that keeping the belt on him was the right result. I couldn't really see this going any other way. Part of me wanted a guilty little AJ Styles title reign because I feel like he excels in every position he is put in. But in terms of long-term booking and telling a proper, fully fleshed out story, wherever that may be going, Drew really sort of had to stay champion here. And it looks like his next opponent, I believe, is going to be Keith Lee. 
on the Raw Legends night, which if given time and if given a proper finish, should be a fantastic match. Number eight, now we're heading over to Stardom, a promotion that has had a cracking year in a year when many promotions have obviously seen their momentum slip slightly due to the pandemic. Alongside maybe only one or two other promotions, Stardom have been affected the least, I guess, by the lockdown and everything. They've managed to keep it moving. They've managed to continue to churn out great show after great show. And a big reason for that has been this woman, Momo Watanabe. Momo is one of the workhorses of Stardom. Uh, she's very well respected. She's still young, which is the despicable because she's so good and she was challenging this week uh, or last week I guess Utami Hayashishita for the big belt and so we had this slightly weird dynamic in this match where even though Momo is young she's really experienced actually and even though she's kind of physically outmatched by the champion she's a lot more savvy in the ring she's a lot more aware of what she's doing so it was quite a unique dynamic where you could easily throw your support behind Momo despite her being I think the better wrestler, as it were. So you had this classic sort of wrestler versus raw ability matchup, uh, and it was a really good match. It went 20 plus minutes, maybe even close to 25. And one thing that Stardom has done consistently throughout 2020 is put on top level uh, title matches. A lot of that was down to the former champion, of course, Mayu Iwatani, who has been absolutely fantastic across the whole uh, 12 months that we've seen her, or, or 11 months of her reign, I suppose. But Utami Hayashishita seems to be carrying that on, and if she comes up against challenges like Momo Watanabe on a regular basis, her reign is also going to be a good one. Like what I was talking about with TLC, part of me wished that she would win the title as a reward for all the great work she's done in her career so far. Unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be, and again, I understand that in terms of long-term booking, I guess. But we move swiftly on now to number seven because we're sticking with stardom and we're going to talk about one of 2020's real breakout stars in the form of Julia. Julia is, of course, and has been for quite some time now, the wonder of stardom champion. That is like the equivalent of the Intercontinental Championship. But I'd suggest the gap between the two top belts in stardom is a lot less than what we'd see typically in Western promotions. And a big reason for that has been the great work done by former champions. But Julia has certainly carried that on. And on the same show as Momo Watanabe, brilliant main event we had this match also it turned out to be a really stacked show in the end a time limit draw between Julia and another champion on the roster in a title versus title match big scenes and when I say time limit draw don't worry it didn't go an hour it went half an hour and uh, I don't know what more to say about it because the next person on my list is her opponent so I'll just wrap up by talking a little bit about Julia generally Julia has been wonderful this year she's got so much charisma yes she might not be one of the super workers of stardom yet but the promise is all there she's got a fantastic look she's got great ability I think her ceiling is incredibly high certainly one to watch out for in 2020 21 if you're not familiar with her already but I can't talk about it for too long because this match went half an hour and it was down to both women in the match so now I have to move on to number six Siuri. Siuri is the current SWA champion which is basically stardom's equivalent of kind of an international belt mixed with a second tier belt. I'll try and explain what I mean. So often these kind of internationally gimmicked belts are used in the same way that New Japan early on used their US title, for example, to try and expand things, to try and get some uh, eyes on the promotion by putting the belt on a name more familiar to a Western audience, for example. Now, Stardom have sort of done that, but they've done it with a, a bit of a tweak to the rules. So basically, this isn't totally an international belt. This belt can only be defended against somebody of a different nationality, I believe, to the champion, which means that we've had both international women's wrestlers as champion, like Viper, now known, of course, as Piper Niven in WWE. Uh, she's held the belt before, but also proper homegrown stardom legends like Io Shirai have also held the title. And at the moment, and I think that's quite a nice little gimmick there, it allows all sorts of people to hold the title. It allows for some very unique matchups as well. Uh, and at the moment, the champion is Sayuri. Now, she is not just a wrestler. She's got an MMA career, a very successful kickboxing career, I believe, as well. And she kicks ass. I was shamefully not too familiar with her before this and now I'm a huge fan and and you know you might think well kickboxer MMA sort of legit style that doesn't lend itself too well to a half hour long match you, you think uh, when you think of MMA athletes like Lesnar Rousey you know Shamrock I suppose as well they don't really tend to have very long matches a lot of the time it turns out that I think Siri can be considered a wrestler just as much as she can be considered an athlete in other fields. Because, I, I mean, it was proven here. She, she kicked Julia's ass, but also got beaten up a lot herself. 
and was awesome on both offense and defense. It was, it was a brilliant match. I'd suggest that maybe both women could have scored more points this week had there been a touch more selling, perhaps, because, you know, there was a lot of, like, shrugging off, a lot of damage to unleash another flurry of offense. But it did make for a very captivating match. I mean, this flew by for a half-hour contest. And the fact that both of them are so relatively low in the top 10 this week shows what a stacked week this has been. So now we move on to number five, and it's time to talk about one of the reasons this has been such a stacked week. We're going to go to Dragon Gate, and we're going to talk about a man that I had no idea about before this week, Hip Hop Kakuta. Hip Hop Kakuta is a member of Dragon Gate's R.E.D., Red Stable. Their heel stable, Pac used to be in charge of it. Uh, we've seen them run roughshod over the Dragon Gate roster over the past few years. But they've had some new recruits, and one of them's this guy. And he's kind of the tall powerhouse of the group. And he's, I think, 20 years old and not very experienced at all. And he's great. Now, I was listening to a few podcasts and stuff. Shout out to, like, Voices of Wrestling and sites like that to get more of an example of, of what this match meant, which I'll get into in a second, because there was a lot of storyline going on here, and when I was watching it, I had to learn a bit more, I had to dig a bit deeper. Now, basically, Kakuta has not wrestled yet in front of a non-pandemic audience. He has not wrestled in front of a standard wrestling audience, which is mad, considering how good he is. You'd never think that he'd been wrestling professionally, properly, for less than a year. And I know that obviously he'll have been training before that and everything, but a lot of what makes a great wrestler great is how they perform in front of a live crowd. And when you've not had the experience of doing that, it must be really difficult. So, I mean, full credit to him for having the timing down and everything in the ring that he needs to be a success in the future. Now onto the match, right? So, without giving too much away yet, because there's more to talk about a bit later on, Kikuta was obviously a member of the heel stable. It was a five on five elimination, no DQ match, and the losing team had to disband. And we're not just chucking the relatively inexperienced Kikuta in there with anybody. We're chucking him in there against Toriumon, uh, some of the most respected legends in Dragon Gate history. We're talking about Dragon Kid, Naruki Doi, uh, Masato Yoshino. This was incredibly being chucked in the deep end, if that makes uh, any sense at all. Now, you might be asking, Jack, did he survive the match? Did he win for his team, his horrible heelish team? Not quite. Um, he eliminated one guy, which was really good. I think it might have been Yoshino. He looked very impressive in the process, but no, he did not survive this match. But he still gets a boatload of points, because that's just how damn impressive his performance was. More on that match later on for absolute certain. But now we move on to number four, uh, Roman Reigns, the big dog, retained his title at TLC, of course. He is still the universal champion. I talked in my Kevin Owens section about why this was the only real course of action for WWE, but Roman continues to be the big, I think, draw of WWE at the minute, the big shining spotlight. And who thought we'd be saying that five years ago? There's no two ways about it. Roman was an absolute boss in this match and has been in this storyline since he first aligned with Paul Heyman and started declaring himself the Tribal Chief. I'm really interested in how Roman matches up against different opponents in this heel persona. Obviously you had his feud against Jey Uso and Jimmy, against both Usos really, where he was intensely personal, it was against a family member, he was establishing himself as the head of the table. It was really compelling stuff. But now that Roman's kind of won that feud and he's got his family on side, whether by coercion or not, um, now he's turning outwards and it's really fascinating to see how he interacts with other opponents, other challenges to his dominance, such as the unbreakable Kevin Owens. And even though he won this match, Roman was certainly, you could tell, there was a great deal of frustration, which is an excellent character touch. Like, yes, I beat this guy, but I couldn't quite put him away and dominate him like I really, really wanted to. And that's the sort of, I guess, rugged, badass quality that a babyface Kevin Owens brings to you, because he believably looks and seems like a guy who just will not stay down. And matching him up against Roman was an excellent touch, in my opinion. We knew, we knew that Owens was never going to realistically win this belt, but also you need these kind of compelling feuds, even if the result is clear during the kind of dead period, the, the I don't know how to describe it, but the, the bit before WrestleMania, but after Survivor Series and after SummerSlam, the bit that fewer people care about, the non-mainstream time for WWE. So well done anyway, Roman, great performance this week and seven points for you next year. I'm really interested to see what happens with Roman Reigns. Number three, back to stardom. Briefly to talk about uh, the champion still, Utami Hayashishita. She beat Momo Watanabe in a match that you could argue that Momo led as the more wrestlery wrestler of the two. But Hayashishita is quickly becoming a proper wrestler's wrestler as well. Yes, she may be less experienced than many of her peers on the stardom roster. Yes, she may have gotten an incredible push 
similar in a way, I guess, to someone like Ronda Rousey, because when she first burst on the scene, she was pushed really hard, of course. And I think that it's fully deserved because like Ronda Rousey, Hayashi Shida is proving that she is just a bit of a natural when it comes to pro wrestling. It would be really, really easy for audiences to hate Utami because of the speed with which she's been pushed, because of the fact that she dethroned the ace of stardom, Mayu Iwatani, and took that title. But at the same time, we've seen this sort of booking work in Japanese wrestling before. We've seen shades of it with the likes of Kazuchika Okada almost a decade ago now, taking that title from Hiroshi Tanahashi and really shaking up the status quo of the promotion. And Stardom's year has been so strong, to be honest, that I fully trust wherever their booking is going. And I think that building up the credibility of Utami by beating people like Momo Watanabe, I think that can only be a good thing and can only spell exciting things for the future of her reign. Who's going to stand up to her? Who's going to beat her for that belt? Will Iwatani come back looking for revenge? Will Utami, Hayashi Shita, th this one, will she go on a mad run and will nobody be able to stop her? Will she become like the Brock Lesnar of stardom? There's various different directions that they can go in with this and I think that Utami is the perfect person to have at the helm for doing so. Yes, she may not have the pedigree or the experience of other great stardom champions of the past like Io Shirai, Kairi Sane, Kairi Hojo, but at the same time, I think that it's all there. Her story is yet to be written and it's gonna be very exciting figuring out what happens next. Next up, number two, we're going back to that Dragon Gate match. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more now and I'm gonna talk about the result. Dragon Kid picks up nine points this week, uh, and he lost heartbreakingly at the final, final hurdle. Dragon Kid was one of the original Toriumon students that became Dragon Gate. There was a bit of a convoluted series of events. Dragon Kid essentially is the heart and soul of Dragon Gate. He is, he is, he lives and breathes it. He is Mr. Dragon Gate, and his name is similar to Dragon Gate, so Dragon Kid, you've got to be careful when you talk about that. He had his heart ripped out <laughs> at Final Gate 2020 in this five on five no DQ elimination match. He was the last man standing, his mask was hanging by a thread, you could see pretty much all of his face and he'd been beaten and battered and he was still fighting on for his stable to stay together because remember the losing team had to disband. Was it going to be Red, R-E-D, this horrible heel stable of upstarts? Or was it going to be the old dogs, who can still really go in the ring, of Toriumon? And, and you'll never guess what, but the old lads lost. This was not Team Cena versus the Nexus, not at all. And I'm not saying that Dragon Kid put on a five-star classic in terms of work rate. It was kind of impossible to have a work rate classic when there's lads running in and there's 10 guys on the apron and they've all got screwdrivers and, and batons and everything, because this match was a bit messy in the best sort of brawly kind of way. But Dragon Kid really carried the spirit of his team. And when established names like Yoshino and Doi were falling early on, I was like, who's going to really carry this match for the baby faces if they're losing all their big names early? And then I thought, obviously it's Dragon Kid. And it was. He also added a touch of nimble high flying here and there, which he, of course he can do despite being in his mid-40s, I believe. Still so smooth. Lots of strikes, lots of defiance from him. But ultimately... It wasn't enough. The next guy on this list is the man who beat him and is possibly 2021's big new star in wrestling, certainly in Japanese wrestling, but he's so talented on the surface that maybe this could spread even further. That's because number one this week, picking up 10 points and it's his first appearance on Wrestlers of the Week and I feel ashamed about that because he's so good. It's SB Kento. SB Kento is the new, brash, cocky, heel, horrible little man that you hate to see win, but also love to see win because he's so good. Like Hip Hop Kakuta, he is hilariously young. He's not quite as inexperienced as Kakuta, but he is, I think, 21 at the time of recording, and I think he was 20 at the time of this match. I think it's just been his birthday. Now, um, he is really good for his age and his level of experience. Watching this match, even before I did my research and learned the history of the match and, and what, what was kind of going on in the background, I could tell who the leader of this faction was, and it wasn't the actual leader. He got eliminated early on. It was SB Kento, man. He is probably gonna overthrow Ata and take over R.E.D. At least that's the way it definitely seems because Ata got eliminated straight away. And I think the door is open for Kento to say, this isn't your stable anymore, mate. Get out. That'll lead to a babyface to have Ata, presumably. But whatever happens with the leadership of R.E.D., SB Kento is the future, man. He is surely a future champion of Dragon Gate. And he didn't win without cheating. There was interference and everything going on, but it was an ODQ match. You can kind of do what you want. And he got four of the five eliminations on his team. I mean, that 
That's pretty huge, especially when it comes against five of the most established and legendary names in Dragon Gate history, which isn't necessarily a short history, that's going back like 20 years or so. The only person I guess missing would have been Shingo Takagi because he obviously went to New Japan Pro Wrestling, but apart from that, you've basically in this match got SB Kento running through the history of the promotion with relative ease. That is a monstrous level push and I cannot wait to see what Dragon Gate do next with this guy. I assume he'll be challenging Shun Skywalker at some point for the championship, and if he doesn't, then I'll start to get very excited, because surely if they're keeping those two apart for a while, that means that when he does get his hands on the champion, a title change is surely in the works. So yes, there we go. Um, I've, I'm a new fan of his. Man, I hope you are too. Check out some of his stuff. Well done, SB Kento. You are my wrestler of the week. Now, before we take a look at the league table, I do have to make a bit of a confession. Um, this is the last episode of Wrestlers of the Week, but I do want to just express my heartfelt thanks to everybody who has supported this series over the course of its three years. And don't worry as well, because we are replacing it with something good. So stay tuned for that coming soon. So there will still be, you know, it's still gonna be my favorite time of the week on a Friday, it's just not gonna be as numbers heavy, I suppose. So yes, once again, thank you so much to everybody who has supported this series. And yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's been quite a ride, there's been ups and downs, but I feel like it's expanded my knowledge of pro wrestling and hopefully it's helped to expand your horizons as well. So without any further ado, it's time for the final ever Wrestlers of the Week League table. That's right, we're gonna find out who Wrestler of the Year is for 2020. Here we go. So at the top of the list on my wrestler of the year for 2020, it is Kenny Omega, the current AEW world champion and two other AEW stars behind him in the form of John Moxley and Cody Rhodes. What excellent years they have had. I don't think that can be too disputed. Shingo Takagi, Hiromu Takahashi, Drew McIntyre, Tetsuya Endo, Keith Lee and Finn Balor round out the top 10. And we've got some excellent names just below them as well. Io Shirai is the top scoring women's wrestler. And I think that is very richly deserved. She's had a great year. So too, though, has Asuka, of course, as well. And we get a variety of names as we reach the bottom there. And in number 20, it's Darby Allen, possibly the future of AEW. So it's been a very interesting year, but it looks like it's Kenny Omega's crown. So there you go. Congratulations to Kenny Omega. You are my wrestler of the year for 2020. Thanks once again to everybody who watched not only this episode, but the series as a whole. It's been a blast over three years and we'll hang on tight and see what's next. Thanks once again, everybody. Stay safe out there, stay positive, leave your thoughts and opinions, why not, in the comments section down below, and I'll see you very soon.